language, German culture, German literature here at Weber College, and um, I'm delighted to be able to contribute to this session. Um, my in introduction got a tiny bit long, so please don't be too mad at me, okay? I just couldn't quite stop. I mean, it, it, it's okay, I think, because there's so many, there are so many important things to say about our scholars here. I just, it, it just didn't seem, they come from so far to sort of cut them out of, it just didn't seem like the right thing to do. So you won't mind, right? Okay, we'll see, all right. So hello and welcome once again to our conference. In the field of German American Mega studies. Mega super. Wie bitte? Mega super bright stars. Mega super bright, okay. Na ja, that's all I need to talk to you. Okay, okay. In the field of German American studies, doctors, uh, Dirk Janssen and Carl Fink, who come to us from foreign domains, Dr. Janssen from Freiburg, Germany, and Dr. Fink from the Viking territory of Northfield, Minnesota. Their backgrounds reveal the wide range of their accomplishments, including the discovery or rediscovery and interpretation of thematic and ideological literary links to the 40 Adres and their implications for the future in places where we perhaps for too long have neglected to explore them. Our first presenter, Dag Janssen, one of the leading scholars in the area of the humanities and transatlantic studies, was born in Westerstede in Lower Saxony, Germany. He studied philosophy, literature, and law at the universities of Kiel and Freiburg and graduated with a degree in law in 1997. The research that followed uh, involving uh, the political philosophy of the Austrian writer Hermann Boch both sharpened his interest in the problems of European exiles in the United States of America in the 20th century and acquainted him with the American cultural setting and history of ideas. So th this is straight from what he gave me, okay? This is not original, okay? I tweaked it a little bit, but the, the thing is that um, what it reveals to us is a great interest in and ability for interdisciplinarity for crossing borders and not just staying within one specific realm. In 2005, he founded a publishing house to introduce American transcendentalism uh, to a German reading public. These are his own words. It has been selected, I've been told by Yogi, to be the in-house publisher for the newly designed Stoltenberg Institute for German American Studies. So congratulations. Since 2011, it also publishes contemporary literature. In addition to his work as a publisher, Janssen is also committed to his career as a lawyer. So we have all of these crossing of boundaries in, in terms of most of the things he seems to be doing. Okay, uh, he has had a long-standing and dynamic interest in Eastern philosophy and has both organized and given lectures on Thoreau, Emerson, Whitman, and a Japanese philosopher, am I, Makiguchi? Yeah? Okay, fine, all right. He's also part of a network of citizens in Freiburg who on a regular basis commemorate the 1848 tradition in the Grand Duchy of Baden, honoring personalities like Karl Schulz, Schulz, uh, Schulz Entschuldigung, Franz Siegel and Friedrich Ecker, people that we've been talking about and will continue to talk about. His aim as a publisher, he writes, is to introduce American transcendentalism to Germany. He has published translations of some addresses of Emerson and of Whitman's Democratic Vistas, which are given special attention in today's presentation, titled Thomas Mann and Walt Whitman, Notes on a Transatlantic Inspiration to Democracy. In his paper, Janssen analyzes the evolution of Thomas Mann, writer and Nobel Prize winner laureate of German literature in 1929, from a non-political, his evolution from a non-political to a political writer and to a representative of a new humanity and democracy. Uh, 
that this evolution spanned decades, eventually leading to Mann's becoming a German ex exile and an American citizen. The talk today throws light on Mann's democratic conversion in the early 1920s, as expressed in his essay on the German Republic, and inquires about the influence his reading of Walt Whitman exerted in this process. It also, I think, invites us to discuss the meaning of the, de of the democratic ideal in the transatlantic dialogue today. If you attended, th this is our first speaker, if you attended the award ceremony yesterday evening, uh, honoring our second speaker uh, with a priest with a, uh, a medal commemorating his contributions to Thur Thuringia. Uh, you will have read about his background summary in the conference program. I refer you to page 10, and you are already familiar with his achievements through the introductions that were given yesterday, so I will not repeat them. They're there, page 10. Please, okay. Uh, leadership, okay. As stated in an additional summary he kindly sent me, he is presently teaching his last German language courses this semester at St. Olaf's College and is retiring at the end of the school year in May 2014. He taught his first language class in 1964 and as he observes, that makes it a half century. In addition to his prolific publications, he hopes to publish two book manuscripts in the first years of his retirement, one on storm and stress anthropology, in which he develops the thesis that the storm and stress period marked the turn from theistic to secular views of the human being, wow, okay, and the other on the fingers of Goethe's brain, a study on Goethe as a visual thinker, in which uh, 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 Fink shows how lines of motion and sequence Goethe drew long before film strips, films, and videos were invented demonstrate his visual thinking. Both of these projects were improved with recent study of Schiller's writings on aesthetics. Fink's primary publication at this point is Goethe's History of Science which was recently reissued in paperback. Fink's talk is intriguingly titled, Schiller's Ode to Joy in Different Tones. It discusses Schiller's understanding, Fink, of the relationship between body and head, and we will see how Fink connects this with thoughts on the 40 acres. Now some comments of my own. <laughs> Having had a sneak preview of their presentations, I believe you will appreciate the profound knowledge, creativity, and high standards of scholarship that Janssen and Fink bring to their work. Not only do they provide a new context for understanding the ideas of the 48ers, but they also challenge us, directly or indirectly, to take a hard look at today's world where past and present intertwine and to reevaluate from the perspective of 1848 the individual and societal rebellions against authority that continue to occur, as well as their repercussions. By extension, we may also find ourselves thinking about the question the goals of the 48ers imply for all democratic societies. The question, freedom, what then? question America has yet to answer as it experiences the ongoing growing pains inherent in the evolution of American freedoms. And all this because two scholars opened the door for us to the events of 1848. At a time when it has become increasingly important to demonstrate to a new generation of students the relevance of German studies for their lives, it is truly refreshing to be among scholars such as Drs. Janssen and Fink, who continue to turn to long-established and respected representatives of the German literary canon, to a Schiller and a Thomas Mann, 
to uncover their connections to past occurrences that have practical meaning for our time. Faced by new educational realities and the search for pragmatic solutions, I am extremely grateful, and I think my colleagues would be also, to Daph Janssen and Carl Fink for reminding us that the old timers, too, equip us with insights that enable us to deal more intelligently and effectively with repetitions and re reincarnations of the past. Please join me in expressing our appreciation for the contributions these distinguished scholars have made to perpetuating the legacy of 1848. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for this kind introduction. And um, only for the record, uh, there's one thing that I have to say. Um, I'm not holding a PhD degree yet. Perhaps this will change sometimes. I'm not sure that this will uh, happen, but um, this is something I have to say. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I have the pleasure to uh, speak to you today here at Vantor College. I'm extremely grateful just to be here and um, I want to uh, thank Dan Walter, Yogi Repman, especially in the Ward uh, work team for uh, making this possible. And I'm really, um, yes, very grateful. I want to speak about Thomas Mann and Walt Whitman today. I'm perhaps walking a bit up and down. At first sight, there seems to be no bridge between this issue and the topic of the conference, but I hope that my talk will offer at some points insights that also throw new, some new light on what you have already heard and will hear in the talks and discussions at this conference. Today, I will not present you the Thomas Mandel writer. Considering the time alone, this wouldn't be possible, so I have to leave many things unsaid about the author of the Buddenbrooks, of the Magic Mountain, and the laureate of the Nobel Prize of Literature in 1929. I'm interested in Thomas Mann, the political man today, the man who in 1919, after World War I, together with his contemporaries, stood in the midst of the rubble of a broken all This Thomas Mann was not in peace Himself in this year, 1919. It was the year of the constitutional founding of the Weimar Republic, the first parliamentary republic and democracy in Germany. His most recent book, Reflections of a Non-Political Man, Betrachtungen eines Unpolitischen, had been published a year before in 1918. The last year of the war, a year at its end, the German Empire eventually had not only lost his emperor, William II, who left Germany for exile in the Netherlands, but also the Great War. In reflections of a non-political man written in the years 1915 to 17, during the war, Mann had opened his thoughts about the relation of culture and politics, or is it better to speak of a non-relation? Culture and politics so could be read in this book stay in contrast to each other. Mann, quote, German humanity is resisting politicization from the bottom, quote, end. And, quote, civilization, an invention of French and Anglo-Saxon thinking, means democracy, and democracy is inconsistent with the spiritual life of Germany. Mann explains, quote, the German people will never love political democracy for one simple reason, because it cannot love politics itself. The much slandered authoritarian state speaks about the Obrigkeitsstaat, 
The much slandered authoritarian state is and will be the form of government that is most suited for and wanted from the German people. He concluded, the monarchy is and will always be for Germany's best. The most prominent notion with which Mann in the reflection agitated against Western value, values and civilization, mainly of French origin, was the world culture. Culture was German, civilization was French, and the latter had to help off and away in the political idea of democracy, and with it, the political idea of democracy. It is not the place here to plunge deeper into the very elaborate, disparate writing um, of some 600 pages that was partly a reaction to Thomas Mann's confessed Francophile brother Heinrich. It was and had been seen as a manifest of a declared national conservative. Some spoke of a conservative uh, revolutionary, and so happened what had to happen. When the new order was in formation, when the Constitutional Assembly in Weimar had been coming together, had discussed, decided that a new constitution was passed, in man's eyes, some took the proclaimed non-relation to political facts, political issues too serious. And these were those who refuted the new conditions, the new order fundamentally and in total, and positioned them against the Republic, against the Constitution, against the Treaty of Versailles, which has been signed in 1990. They argued Thomas Mann is right when he sees German culture and the Germanic outside the circle of the Republican Democratic. He is on the right track when he sees in German nationalism and in German spiritual life a column much loftier and higher than that mundane or lower of French and Anglo-Saxon. It were those friends of the, the reflections of a non-political man who hailed the book and referred to its author in heated public debates as one of theirs who made man feel uneasy. And so he took stock of himself. The first public address in which Mann confessed himself to the young German Weimar Republic was his talk of the German Rep uh, Republic, von Deutscher Republik. He delivered it on October 13, 1922 in Berlin at the occasion of the 16th birthday of Gerhard Hauptmann, then the representative writer of Germany. He wanted, quote, to co contribute in a spiritual way to this necessary creation and to instill unfortunate, unfortunate state that has no citizens with something of an idea, a soul, a spirit of them. In this address, he referred to the German poet Georg Philipp Friedrich von Hardenberg, 1772 until 1801, called Novalis to do the, just this, to instill new life spirit to the Republic and to question some national conservatives who argued democratic thinking could be found any, couldn't be found anywhere in Germany. In Novalis, man expounded, one can find a German whose thinking not only reveals Republican and democratic thought, but a person who incorporates it. With Novalis, Mann also involved German Romanticism, a literary and philosophic movement in the intellectual history of Germany at the beginning of the 19th century. German Romanticism rose up against the sober and rational spirit of enlightenment and was critical to the French Revolution. By going back to this spiritual movement, Mann thought he would be able to win the Germans over to democracy, especially most conservative. And Mann invoked Walt Whitman. Whitman, born 1819 till uh, 18, uh, 1892, was the most significant American poet in the second half of the 19th century, and he was also a thinker. In him, Mann claimed to have an American who had been able to happily conjoin the ideas of culture and democracy. Here was a work of art and culture from the Anglo-Saxon sphere that not only came close to those of German descent, but, but, but was on par with them. And Whitman was American. 
America in German public opinion then stood for Americanism, the spirit of capital and materials. It stood for a shallow and outward orientated way of thinking that was alien to the German cultural sphere, especially its huge realm of introspection, inner Ewigkeit. America's political idealism, with which the nation had got to the European war in 1917, her making the way the world safe for democracy, was, com was considered political naive, and it was generally held that this idealism had been crushed altogether with President Wilson's plan for a new order, a League of Nature, Nations, etc., with the failed Treaty of Versailles in 1919. The cultural foundation that these plans considered they had to fail. There was one voice in the polyphonic choir of critics. Two main messages can be distilled out of Mann's address of the German Republic. The American democracy knows culture, and also the German culture knows democracy. The shock this new assessment caused, and especially Mann's confession to the new second belief, was substantial. With it, the idea of a democratic cultural nation found entry in the new republic, the Republican German public, an idea and concept, the author of the reflections of a non-political man a few years before would have called a contradiction in terms. A democratic cultural nation, an impossible and inconceivable At once was heard of right-wing national conservatives and reactionists, the man of the reflections deserted, and further, man overboard. In some circles, he sunk into the new zeitgeist, back down to the new republic, betrayed his Germanity, came out to be a beetle of the prevailing powers of this age. <coughs> it was also criticized that man is self-contradictory, the reflections of 1918 and the address 1922 were incompatible. But Mann didn't want to admit objections of this kind. For him, who still in 1921 uttered that he reads the reflections without pain, often with applause, they were as true as the new confession to the Republic. They had been only a sentimental obituary past epoch of the cultural bourgeoisie, but the new confession for him was the order of the day and acknowledged new circumstances. One may find this convincing or not. As a matter of fact, Mann made some revisions and reflections, calmed down some polemics in his argument of 1918 when he prepared the new second edition of the book published in 1922. The first edition had been reprinted. What was left around the reflections of a non-political man for a long time to come was a stain. Representatives of the progressive middle class reminded Mann repeatedly of his statements about Germanic culture and monarchism. And re the representative of right-wing nationalism were now sure that Mann in nature was a knave without a fatherland and a Western liberty, libertine. For the orthodoxies of both groups, Mann was alien for some time, and in the case of the right-wing nationalism, the later National Socialists, this would, this would never change in Mann's lifetime. With him and their cause, nobody could come. It was, among others, precisely this, what Mann, with his Republic speech, wanted to make clear. And this new position calmed his mind. But let us look a bit closer on the address that, according to Mann, primarily tries to attract the youth of Germany to democracy. He writes, quote, My aim, which I express quite candidly, is to win you, as far as that is needed, to the side of the, the Republic, to the side of what is called democracy and what I call humanity. Quote and. Because Mann continues, quote, the Republic and the democracy are inner facts today. They are for all of us, each of us, and denying this means lying. Quote 
this is a new kind of Innerlichkeit. Mann's reference to the notion of humanity builds a bridge from democracy to the German cultural and intellectual history, since he was aware that a mere adoption of Western liberal thought would not be accepted by his conservative and skeptical audience. Novalis, not the German Republic, it was just said, is Mann's man for the idea that also in German culture, representatives are to be found for the affair expressed in democracy as a political idea. And Mann not only engaged Novalis, the philosopher and poet, as midwife, but the whole spiritual movement with which he was aligned, Roman, German Romanticism. At this point, I want to uh, make a small extra uh, Relation. I have here some uh, three sides um, with the relation of um, Thomas Mann, Novalis, and German Romanticism in my manuscript. And um, I want to uh, shop this a bit up. That what Mann explains there, um, the line of Novalis quotes, is that German Romanticism is uh, inclined to a state philosophy, philosophy of the state, you could call this statism, I think that's the word. And the second, third point he makes is that uh, this German Romanticism has a special um, relation also to, to uh, economics, to economy, is able to uh, convince people who argue economically. The third one is that is also rational. So his project is to uh, uh, make an offer for the right-wing Germans in his audience there, October 13, 1922, who were very critical to the new German Republic because World War War, uh, uh, well, World War One lost and all the circumstances, uh, Treaty of Versailles, something uh, all around them, that he tried to give a new basement, a new, a new foundation for uh, Germans to think about their culture as also inheriting republican and democratic thought. The most important problem that occurs in this uh, relation to Novalis, a German Romanticism, is uh, what can be said as a mysticism of the state. German Empire was down four years ago and it was uh, uh, constituted 1871, Versailles, Bismarck, William II. And now man had the idea to uh, given the mysticism of uh, a state back in democratic hands by implementing something like German Romanticism to the public. It was a very uh, unstable construction and it is not really uh, convincing, I think. And one later also uh, uh, conceded this. Um, and uh, so this is the very uh, uh, general uh, stroke, it's a big stroke that I want to make uh, uh, about Thomas Mann's relation to German rom Romanticism in Novalis. This is a really crit critical one concerning the uh, Tragfähigkeit, yes, uh, the, uh, the um, stability of that, that, that bridge that he is building up, especially for conservative, uh, conservative Germans. The second reference with which Mann tries to uh, awaken German Jew, uh, youth for the Republican Democratic ideal with Walt Whitman, unlike Novalis, nearly the contemporary. In Whitman, it is to feel and of the German Republic. Mann saw that, what was really new, and what he tried to convey to his audience with intensive references from Novalis to Whitman, legitimizing the latter also, the American by reference to the German, and um, vice versa, uh, references. Whitman was not only a supplement, 
This becomes clear when one declares that his address, quote, actually was planned as a lecture about this curious pair about Morales and Whitman, and that it still may become this, quote, and, and he continues, quote, because setting democracy, the republic, in relation to German romanticism, doesn't this mean to make them plausible also to puzzle defiant fellow Germans? Whitman, at the quotes from his poetry in Leaves of Grass, and far more from his political essay, Democratic Vistas, are meant to represent an original idea of democracy and republic. And now, some quotes from Mann's address. For not only it is enough, says Whitman in his Democratic Vistas, that the new blood, new frame of democracy, shall be vivified and held together merrily by political superficial suffrage, legislation, and so on. But it's clear to me, unless it goes deeper, gets at least a firm and warm hold in man's heart, emotion, and belief, as in their days, feudalism or ecclesiasticism, and inaugurates its own perennial sources dwelling from its center forever, its strength will be defective, its growth doubtful, and its main charm wanting. Mann, in the following, following, connects the main charm Whitman speaks of to the sphere of Romanticism. But does also this quote vindicate the idea of a close relation to the state? Whitman declares it is not enough that the new frame of democracy shall be held together merely by political means, superficial suffrage, legislation, and so on. The overall quote implies instead an idea of a democ democratic and religiously informed individual. This is a very important point. He relates, he, he relates also Whitman to the state, to the idea of the state, you know, a, a, a political idea to uh, um, get uh, the conservatives on his side, on the side of democracy. But this is not to be found in Whitman himself. Man quotes Whitman. The idea of perfect individualism, it is indeed the deepest that deepest tings and gives character to the idea of the community, for it is mainly and only to serve the independent human being that we favor strong community and cohesion, as it gives to the best vitality and freedom to the rights of the states, every of it as important as the right of the nation, the union, that we insist on the identity of the union at all hazards. Man refers to Whitman's idea of perfect individualism when he hereafter sees an instinct of a state building individualism. But is this what Whitman writes about? He uses the word community in more global cohesion and not the word state in the first part of his argument. And where he thirds in an analogy writes about union. And American here knows, uh, knows he means the federal state. He is first and foremost sensitive about the rights of the states. What Whitman expounds is the creation of a community by means of a perfect individual independent human being. Next quote. Do you want to have in yourself the divine, vast, general law? Then merge yourself in it. This says Whitman after he has said before, nor is the aesthetic point always an important one without fascination for highest gaining souls. The common ambition strange for, strains for elevations to become some privileged exclusive. The master sees greatness and help in being part of the mass. Nothing will do as well as common ground for them. Also in this quote, the word state is missing. The American instead speaks of a general law and surprisingly refers to the mass as a common ground. Man comments, very good. This is once more the unity of spiritual life 
the life of the state, and nationalism as the culture of peace. And the reader asks himself, where does he take this? As can be seen in Mann's remarks to these three quotes of Whitman's Democratic Vistas, the idea of the state is so artificially applied to Whitman's comments that it seems forced. Given this method of extrapolation, it is no surprise that also other references from Novalis to Whitman, for example, their view of humanity, remain pale and shallow. With Whitman, one could say, can say, there is no state to make. Research of Mann's papers and sources related to Whitman from the time Mann was preparing his address of the German Republic, 1922, show, shows, as Heinrich Detering recently figured out, that Mann overall in his Whitman studies was focused, quote, on the religious, and that is the point in one with this anthropological foundation of the year the idea of democracy, quote and the next quote, with this correspondence, corresponds the far-reaching indifference of all institutional and judicial, judicial procedural rules. This anthropological foundation will not disappear in his address, but will step back there in favor of a painstaking defense of the Republic out of the spirit of German Romanticism. Make us one more jump here. It seems that Novalis and German Romanticism, as Mann then implied, were not suitable to persuade the Germans to find the Republican democratic in their own tradition, at least not in the year 1922. Actually, it was just German Romanticism that gave German nationalism the 1920s and later some foothold in the German history of ideas. Certainly, Romanticism is not accountable for that what followed. Yet, the romantic sympathy with death one identifies at the end of the address with Novalis may have had some effect on this mésalliance at Romanticism's charge. The transfer of this sympathy with death and its specific overtone on, as man himself admit, admits, the, quote, clear, fresh, and fragrant healthiness of the singer of Manhattan, quote, and, is at least questionable. Man ends his address with the famous cry, long live the Republic. Wolf Lepenis, in his masterful book, The Seduction of German Culture and German History, comments, quote, overwhelmed by the task to connect the Republic, the idea of democracy and German Romanticism, Thomas Mann expressed himself to an enthusiasm that for himself must have felt strange, and that at the end made him utter the invitation to our still clumsy tongues to break out in the cry, long live the Republic. Quote Who reads the address of the German Republic today and in the light of Mann's self-proclaimed goal to win his audience over to democracy, is not surprised that in the end this it failed. But it was his first public confession to the Weimar Republic, to what he called his democratic humanity, and so it had consequences. It marks the point where his way and the way of the national right, the reaction parted, and they did. decided to refer to Whitman, his anthropology and theory of democracy without mediation, presenting Whitman without this idea to uh, um, get conservatives, national right audience in by implementing uh, this idea of state, state mysticism. Or what if he had related Whitman to another tradition in German intellectual in view of Mann's remarks in an open letter, that is really very interesting, 
in the Frankfurter Zeitung on April 16, 1922. Carl, I uh, told you just, uh, yesterday about the, the, the connection that will follow now. These considerations are not as far-fetched fa fetched as it seems. The letter printed on the front page of this upper-class newspaper was addressed at Hans Reisiger, who had presented Mann his just published ample and extensively annotated German translation of the works of Walt Whitman in the midst of the preparations for of the German Republic. With enthusiasm, Mann writes, quote, I'm thoroughly delighted with owing a copy of your Walt Whitman's back and cannot thank you enough as I'm sure that the German public will also not be able to thank you enough for this great, important, indeed sacred gift. Ever since I acquired a few volumes, I have been consistently taking them off, up, reading now here and now there. I have read the biographical introduction in its entirety, in, 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 its, in its entirety, and deem it a, main, a minor masterpiece infused it is truly a service of the highest order that you have rendered us, expanding patient devotion and enthusiastic labor to acquaint us with this powerful mind and a profoundly new form of humanity. Us Germans, who are at once old and immature, for whom contact with this future shaping humanity can, can become a blessing, provided we know how to take up for me, this book has been nothing less than a gift from heaven, for now I really see that what Whitman calls democracy is no, nothing other than what we, in an old-fashioned usage, call humanity. Just as I also see that it cannot be done with Goethe alone, that a shot of Whitman will be necessary to achieve the feeling of the new humanity, even though these two fatherly figures have much in common, above all, the sensual life. Reisinger's translation initially introduced Mann to Whitman in all its breadth. breadth. This happened in spring 1922, eventually in the year of his Republican term. Incorporated in it, Mann found also extracts of Whitman's political essay, Democratic Vistas, some of them cited with Walt Whitman's back, in Mann's words, the gift from heaven, he held in hand an idea that for him was totally worth for standing on its own, and more so, he saw the thunderer of Man Manhattan, as he puts it, in of the German Republic, eye to eye with the divine name of Weimar. Proclaiming in autumn 1922 with Whitman the oneness of democracy and humanity, Mann then nonetheless affiliates him with Novalis and German Romanticism. However, spring 1922 shows Mann could have walked another way, yet the road is still open. And now at the end, I can ask John about the site from his democratic business. We have frequently, frequently printed the word democracy, Whitman's democratic wisdom. We have frequently printed the word democracy. Yet, it cannot too often, I cannot too often repeat that it is a word, the real gist of which still sleeps, quite unawakened, notwithstanding the resonance, the many angry tempests out of which its syllables have come from pen Tongue. It is a great word whose history, I suppose, remains unwritten, because that history has yet to be enacted. Thank you.
the 19th century as a long road to democracy for both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, the roads, it's like the many roads to Rome. Um, and you take the one that we are at the conference, 18, 1848, um, there are places before um, the Schleswig-Holstein and, and the period 1800 to 1848, and if you divide the 19th century and a half uh, with the Civil War at the middle, uh, we have a long way to go. And in my talk, I'd like to see how the uh, Civil War is part of the, or beyond the Civil War, is the, is the Civil Rights Movement, which still exists today. And that path does have to start more broadly than the date 1848. It's the path then that the path that came out of the classics that I would like to draw, following somewhat with the Novalis and the Lippmann uh, line of thinking too. You have on the handout um, an abstract and you can read at that at your leisure and you have the quotations that I address and and uh, my students make fun of me if I say quotation and do this without saying quotation. And so they say we look like monkeys when we do that. Um, I won't do that, so maybe the quotations, I'll just blend my talk one sentence into another. That's not a critique of me or our professors, but the students do wonder. And I say in German, you can use indirect discourse subjunctive. You don't have to use that quotation. So uh, German is better than English, I tell them. OK, those are preliminary things I do want to pick up then. Um, with the start with Friedrich Schiller and move my way through past the Civil War into some outcomes. Uh, so let me start with Friedrich Schiller. Was born in 1759 in Marbach in Baden-Württemberg during the Seven Years' War. His father was a military doctor, so young Fritz, named after Frederick the Great, and his five older sisters did not see much of the father until the war was over and the family moved to Loch, in the village with cheaper housing but poorer schools. The village pastor tutored the boy for the clergy, but his talents for technical precision drew the attention of Duke Karl Eugen, so he was drafted into the elite military school of Karlsschule in Stuttgart. There he finished a degree in medicine with a provocative dissertation title on the connection of the animal and spiritual nature of human beings. He now was the property of the state. But the medical profession did not suit him, so he left town secretly for Mannheim to the north, and from there he left the state of Baden-Württemberg altogether and moved east to a village outside of Leipzig. Here he found a new life among friends of the writer and musician Christian Gottfried Kranner. He called this new place an Elysium. We actually have a town not far from Northville called Elysium. It's on a lake. It's beautiful. And the summer of 1785, he wrote to his friend Colonel how it had, that area had inspired him to write a poem about joy. The poem was not intended, was not intended as a hymn for church or for state, nor as the background music for movies and shopping malls and construction sites, a Sony Center in Berlin. Not even for Beethoven's world famous Ninth Symphony. It was simply a situation poem, Gelegenheitsgedicht, dedicated to friends at a housewarming party in a village outside of Leipzig called Gorfus. Part one, I got four parts. Part one is on Schiller's Intensified Joy, 1785 poem. A few comments. In Schiller's poem, we see the joy of friendship in the opening lines. Quote him, joy, beautiful sparkle of the god, daughter of Elysium. We enter, fire drunk, heavenly one, your shrine, in the quote. But in the 96 lines, there is also the outrage of anger. This is the part that took over the poem in the next three decades, as the people in the 
German territories struggled for unity in democratic institutions. Over the next three decades, short and long versions of Schiller's poem were a hit among students at parties and rallies, demonstrations, starting in Jena, where Schiller taught history. The poem is long, but in each stanza, he recycles joy in a new context as he vents the anger against the common enemy. Nine times in nine stanzas, Schiller's poem raises hopes of freedom for millions under a canopy of one understanding God. He's not rational, he's understanding. In one cycle, comrades share wine. In another, exercise force. And together they celebrate rewards in heaven with oaths of loyalty, bonded by the rites of wine. Even the cannibalism of war is forgiven. Students liked stanza seven especially. Joy bubbles in the cup, in the, gold, in the grapes golden blood, golden blood. Cannibals drink gentleness, the fearful drink courage. These lines become the chants of young Germans seeking democratic reform from local petty princes and independence from the global, global armies of Napoleon. During Schiller's lifetime, his poem was set to music in 40 different com compositions, including one by his friend Crown. There, was also, there were also new poems written to sharpen the patriotic uh, sensibilities of, Germans, of the Germans. Most notorious was the one by Karl Fodden, a political student activist studying law at Gießen University in Hessen. He founded the Gießen Blacks, Gießen Schwarzen, a group of militants activists. Fodden was also well known as one of the organizers of the Wartburg Festival of October 18, 1817 when about 400 students demonstrated for a national unity. In 1818, the following year, Fallen rose to statewide fame, or nationwide point fame, in the poem he called The Great Song, Das Große Lied, <coughs> which was similar in form, but more militant in tone than Schiller's poem. Fallen framed his song in the populist language of Martin Luther, recalling or calling on rulers to join citizens to fight for political freedom. I quote Fodden's poem, first line, Arise, ye princes, ye people, arise. Freedom and vengeance in full career. God's tempest in blood, in tempests in blood are approaching. In, 19, in 1890, the poem was on and on for five pages. In 1819, the following year, three intense years, one right after another, in 1819, Fallen was arrested but acquitted for conspiracy in the assassination of Friedrich von Kotzebue, while one of the, which one of his students, while one of his students, Ludwig Sand, was um, executed and became a martyr of the cause. By then, that is one of Sand's, uh, Fallen's students, we're working with a third generation here, uh, Sands was executed and uh, became a martyr of the cause for freedom. By then, Fulham had rejected, he had rejected the Teutonic barbarism of the movement to follow more explicitly Schiller's rules for civic engagement. Still, by association, Fulham was an enemy of the state, and after some employment in Switzerland, he sailed for America in 1824, in the same year that Beethoven's Ninth Symphony premiered in Vienna. Second part, Beethoven's New Sound. 1824. Ludwig van Beethoven was born in Bonn, where he met one of Schiller's students, Bartholomus Fischenich. Fischenich had a degree in law and had just returned from a leave of absence in Jena, where he had been a regular guest at the home of Schiller and his wife, Caroline von Wolzow. When Fischenich returned to Bonn in 1792, he brought with him news of new trends to the east Jena, including lectures on Schiller's poem. In a letter from January 26, 1793, Fischenich wrote to Schiller's wife about Beethoven's plan to set each stanza of Schiller's poem to music. This did not happen overnight. From Bonn, Beethoven went to Vienna, where he returned to the project often over the next three decades. 
As the sounds of street demonstrations and marching armies grew, Beethoven found a way to set Schiller's poem to music by a shift in focus. He kept the dueling animal and spiritual emotions that Schiller had found trapped in the human body, but he put joy to the center of the text and gave more voice to the daughter of Elysium. First four lines of the course finale are a personal appeal to unwitting fans of Schiller and the world to keep the promise but to forgive the enemy. Schiller, or Beethoven's first four lines in the finale, oh friends, not these tones, rather let us raise our voice to more pleasing, more joyful sounds, joy, joy. Strictly speaking, these four lines are the only ones that Beethoven wrote for the course finale. The others were all selected from the 96 lines of Schiller's final version, published in 1805. From Beethoven's critical distance, however, in the wake of uprisings throughout Europe, we are admonished to look for other tones in Schiller's original poem. In Beethoven's 36 lines, we take comfort in the encompassing equality of all human beings under God. A few quotations from Beethoven's lines, selected from Schiller. Joy, beauteous spark of divinity, daughter of Elysium, all men become brothers where your gentle wing abides. In other stanzas, Beethoven followed Schiller's prerequisite for brotherhood. Prerequisite, another quote, quoted line, Beethoven quoted from Schiller, Quotation, whoever has been so fortunate to be a friend of a friend, he who has obtained a wife, add this to the jubilation. The health of our environment to the environment of Mother Earth is also at stake in the lines Beethoven took from Schiller. Quote, joy all creatures drink at the beasts, at the breasts of nature. Pleasure was to the worm given, and the sheriff stands before God. Beethoven sharpened the ecstasy and the world view of the original poem with a full range of male and female voices and musical instruments. The, composi the composition by Beethoven was an aesthetic force not previously experienced anywhere in the world. On April 5, 1846, we're getting close to 1848, Richard Wagner tried to kick up the force a notch by setting Beethoven's composition to Goethe's Faust, which was essentially intended to replace moral admonitions with a Germanic war. A month later, on May 20, 1846, Beethoven's Ninth reached the shores of America. It premiered in a new English translation with a course finale of 80 sopranos, 50 altos, 50 tenors, and 80 baritones. The event was scheduled for the Castle Gardens in Manhattan. And by coincidence, on that same day, about 50,000 American patriots streamed into Battery Park nearby to celebrate General Zachary Taylor's victory against Mexico on the Rio Grande. News of the victory reached New York on the day of the premiere. So within earshot, one group sang to the joy of brotherhood around the world, while the other to freedom from Spanish influence to the South. By 1846, the dueling sentiments of the body, anger and joy, were alive and well, but the form of discourse of the text and, and, the, and to a changing era. Third part, Fallen, we're back to Fallen. He came to America. <laughs> Fallen's, I'm going to call this Fallen's legal craft, 1834. By the time Beethoven had composed the Ninth Symphony, Symphony in 1824, Fulham had entered a new relationship to state-sanctioned tyranny, tyranny. He set new tones to old themes and followed step-by-step step the art of anger management outlined by Schiller in his Letters on the Aesthetic Education of Mankind, 1795. From Schiller, he learned that even in harm's way, we must exhaust all possible remedies for skills available in the arts and sciences. In a second life found in America, Fallen brought Schiller's dictum for civic engagement onto the world stage of international law. In America, Fallen relied less on poetics and more on his university degree in institutional 
in constitutional and ecclesiastical law, his skill as a preacher and avocation and teacher also were engaged for a new cause. In 1832, he, came, he became the first professor of German language and literature in the United States with an appointment at Harvard University, but was promptly fired two years later after his speech titled, An Address to the People of the United States on the Subject of Slavery. Well known for his abolitionist views, he was asked to draft the main principles of the movement for the first New England anti-slavery convention held in Boston on May 27, 29, 1834. His speech was a work of art in blending legal craft and classical rhetoric with an appeal to moral cause so well illustrated in Schiller's dramas. The fifth volume of Fulham's collected works are all interpretations of Schiller's dramas, every one of them, even the ones Schiller did publish. He opened the address to the American people address on anti-slavery by eliminating from debate questions about evil empires, and political victories, and racial dynamics, essentially discounting all matters of physical and material gain as re required in Schiller's aesthetics. The entire speech of 40 pages is focused on one point, the collision, quotation collision, his word, between the Declaration of Independence and the American Constitution. In new tones, the daughter of Elysium was shaping a new kind of brotherhood. Pollen pointed to the hypocrisy that this country celebrates every 4th of July, I quote Pollen, the unlawfulness of the government established over the slave in the same terms in which it justifies the self-government of the free. He asserts that, I quote him again, we cannot hold this simple and incontestable truth with impunity that we drink the cup of freedom in our own condemnation unless we are willing to confess obedience to the law of liberty which we have proclaimed and by which we have to be judged. The, de the declaration, he argues, at the same time exhibits, I quote him again, our glory, our shame, our inconsistency. In quote. At the core At the core of his argument, he bears down on the issue of the runaway slave and the rights of owners to cross state lines to regain their property. It was in the court of law that he hoped to amend Article 4, Section 3, Paragraph 3, which says, quotation from Fulham's version of the American Constitution, I quote, no, cross, no person, this is the Constitution now, no person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service of labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. This illegal law, Fulham asserts, put the two founding five documents on a commission course, and in his words, put, two na put the nation at risk. Fourth part, last part, more or less the conclusion. I do have a short statement of conclusion, but really, in the end, this is, the fourth part is on Du Bois, the, the first form formation um, of the um, uh, American, African American Civil Rights Movement. Uh, so, I'll call this section Du Bois' Talent and Intent after an essay he wrote with Max Weber on the, um, if you take a, a, any group at the bottom of the social economic scale and from them create a 10% educated, you will grow to a civil, uh, to a right equal in social um, and not necessarily needing legal uh, support will have a social and economic value. It's called the essay Du Bois's Talent of Ten. After the German territories in Europe, I, I skip over the Civil War, and the Civil War is irrelevant in Schiller's aesthetics and in those that Beethoven and Fallen and those that believe that in civic discourse we achieve over time without war. 
That's the line of thought. After the German territories in Europe failed to form a democratic unity in 1848, new sounds of Schiller emerged from the frontiers on both sides of the Atlantic to the east in Russia and to the west in America. By then it was no longer the storm and stress lyrics of Schiller, rather the philosophy of aesthetic education that guided social and political behavior against state-sanctioned tyranny. In 1842, Eliza Lee Tabat Fulham, that's Fulham's wife, by the way, 1848 is often taken back to New York and Carl Schutz. That's not the trail of the Schiller aesthetics. The trail of the Schiller aesthetics is via Fulham and Boston and Harvard and New England anti-slavery. She published uh, her husband's work, um, uh, what do you mean, yeah. 1842, Eliza Fullen published her husband's Harvard lectures on Schiller, giving Germans from the New England states the same Schiller that immigrants from Germany packed into their suitcases in 1848. These two groups, one from New England, another from Germany, settled in Iowa, the latter concentrated in Davenport. In this frontier town on the Mississippi River, they celebrated Schiller's 100th birthday uh, November 10, 1859, orations on the art of confronting tyranny, which they illustrated on the stage with his drawings. The philosopher Schiller uh, survived the American Civil War strong enough to guide still another frontier against state sanctioned tyranny. This time, the African American Civil Rights Movement, founded by William E. B. Du Bois, 1868 to 1963. Du Bois was born free in 1868 of the same year that the 14th Amendment granted freed slave citizenship with guarantees to civil rights. A valedictorian in high school and a top student at Fisk University gave Du Bois junior status at Harvard University, where he graduated with honors in 1890 and began graduate studies in African American history. From 1892 to 94, Du Bois studied in Berlin, where he re revisited the German classical literatures and developed a lifelong friendship with Max Weber, the founder of modern sociology. The biographer, David Levering Lewis, gave the chapter in this chapter in Du Bois's life the title Lehrjahr, grounding his development uh, years in the works of classical Weimar. Levering, the biographer, writes how Du Bois had planned to, I quote Levering, spend seven weeks in intensive German language con uh, conversation in Eisenach, living in the pension of Herr Dr. Johannes Marbach, the rector of the Wartburg, and his family. This levering quoted from Du Bois' own memoir. <coughs> in his book on the souls of black folk, um, he combined classical skills with technical training and new disciplines in this synthesis, adding new tones to Schiller's own um, Setting, by setting a poetic model to African-American folk music. In chapter one of our spiritual strivings in Du Bois' book on souls of black folk, he contrasts two emotions, however, not so much the rage and joy as the grief and joy. I quote uh, the quotation from um, uh, Du Bois, O water, voice of my heart, crying in the sand, all night long, crying with a mournful cry. He frames, the voice frames the condition of the black folk in the aspirations of the German storm and stress movement. I quote the voice again. Storm and stress today rocks our little boat on the mad waters of the world, sea. Here is within and without the sound of conflict, the burning of the, of the body and the rending of a soul. You, in the boat. For a new age in the art of living, he opens chapter four of the meaning of progress with lines from Schiller's The Maid of Orleo, which he sent to the African American folk song, My Way's Cloudy. You can click on it and find it, and it's, um, it's a musicologist's job to see how Schiller's lines from The Maid of Orleo would be put to that song. That song is quite popular, and it's, it's, a, it's a study it's a technology on how that composition would work. I can't do that. From Schiller's drama, he selected Joan of Arc's monologue in, four, in Act 4, Scene 1, where she becomes resolute in confronting the enemy, 
I quote her from Schiller. When, this is, this is Schiller in the drama that we think we live by when we want to fight, but it's just the resolution and not the fight that we see. When thou wouldst manifest thy might, choose instruments beyond desire, the leaders of the angel choir, obedient children of the spheres, they know no longing, they know no tears. The boys quotes Schiller for his book on the black African American movement. You boys sends the message that we do not retreat into resignation, but we strive forward as did Goethe's Faust, he quotes Faust in German also. In Bären sollst du, sollst in Bären. Deny yourself, you must deny yourself. In his admonition to self-denial and discipline, Du Bois builds on Schiller's principles of civic, technical, and artistic training for African Americans. I quote, to quote Du Bois, the vision of life that raise, raises, rises from these dark eyes as in a nothing mean or selfish, not at Oxford or at Leipzig, not at Yale or Columbia, is there an air of higher resolve or more unfettered striving. For Du Bois, the arts were the tools of progress, and this and in this vision he followed, followed the model of Weimar classicism. A short conclusion. In this, in his, I have a dream speech on August 28, 1963. Martin Luther King Jr. reminded the American people that the Amer African American continues to live in the divide between two documents of the founding fathers. When the architects, I quote, King, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. These two documents frame the Schiller experience. One shouts songs of freedom and joy, the other articles of law and constraint. These are the sentiments of the human body and the body of politic as well. The formula from Schiller is to vent anger by releasing joy with a friend of a friend. was mentioned, and um, what is stressed kind of in the last uh, decades is there were some strong anti-Jewish sentiments expressed by students, and even books were burned, and so on. Well, there's this uh, wonderful hero story, the Oldshausen brothers and 25 uh, students from Kiel University walked from Kiel to Eisenach at a great time, three and a half weeks, we have a diary about this kind of uh, journey, um, a very joyful, very important Wartburg Fest. What do you know about this anti-Jewish sentiments during the Wartburg Fest? Not specific anti-Jewish, but very specifically anti-Germanic, the Teutonic movement. Fallen uh, is the greatest transformed figure off of Schiller's, well, they go in Fallen, but Fallen transformed out of the, the visceral Teutonic call for, for, for fight and organized, help organized, one of several organizers of the Worker Festival, but did, but did not go. And he stayed back in Gießen and, and drank wine with his friends. The drinking of wine, a very part of Protestant sacrament, well, well, that's Christian sacrament, but he stayed back and he stayed home for a 
thank you for that because that might have been one of a number of reasons. But the one that he states, or that his wife states in volume one on his memoirs, is that um, he could no longer, uh, now we're talking about 1817, and then 1818, he cuts a new assassination, the intention, the intention is rising. And so there were a number of elements in mass demonstration, only 400 students at the Warburg Festival, and he did not like it and stay home in decent with fellow activists. Specifically, the anti-Jewish uh, somehow Fallen uses the language of Martin Luther Reformation, but it's the public revolutionary language that Martin Luther has picked up. And uh, we rarely talk about the volume of Martin Luther on anti-Semitism, so it's very likely that that was also but I, had, I think we find that in the five volumes in volume one. Now whether, the interesting thing about um, the, the fallen five volumes are, oh, he died in 1840, and his wife published the collection in 1842, and she wrote the memoir, the introductory volume, and, uh, and even the address on anti-slavery is so polished. It is Boston elite. Uh, families, uh, Fallen Kabot, Kabot is the family, the, the Boston family that he married. The language is so sophisticated, I cannot believe that it was done by a native German who arrived and was only in America 10 years. I think that we need to study the uh, Eliza Follett, uh, uh, Eliza Kobok is her. We need to study her public, her work. She's a public author in our own right. And there we might find how he was handling, because she interpreted his time in Germany. We don't have much scholarship. We have Spindler's wonderful dissertation in 1960. We have Frank Marin, who does some quotation materials, but we don't have very many. I've been, I was amazed that we have so little on the first German prop in America. Part of crop, <coughs> and then the first New England anti slavery address. They asked to draft that. I think he had such a support system in Boston that it was, a, it was somewhat of an industry already. And I, I would believe, I would be, it would be hard to imagine, to imagine that out of Fulham's texts that he would have been the author of the anti Semitism. But I would also believe it was. That would be a question also on the transcendentalism. Uh, the, uh, what did the Americans pick up on the anti-Semitism? It doesn't really raise, rise very high until the 1840s with Karl Marx. Uh, we heard some of that last night uh, at, the, at the talk. Um, yeah, I, the the, the, the Vorschrift by Karl Marx is an interaction with the writers from France, and I think they're most interesting. The pre-48 document, they're very interesting because they uh, address all those issues of anti-Semitism. May I have a second question? Um, our colleague from Berlin, Peter Matthes, um, he wrote a little um, email and comparing sort of the radicalization of 1968 that students um, frustrated with the West German situation became radical terrorists. And he compared that to the movement after the Wartburg Fest, Kotzebue, Ludwigsand, um, and the pre-March formats radicalization. Do you see similar <coughs> parallels? I tell that story to the students. Uh, the students, beginning with Blackwell, took over political movements. And uh, it was only eclipsed uh, by other groups, women's suffrage, and, uh, and women's suffrage collapsed with the, the African American in Frederick Douglass. And I was shocked to see that it wasn't Frederick 
Douglas that wrote, that gave the first address, but that uh, New England intellectuals called on Fulham. And uh, the, that, I, I think, is somewhat of an interlude. The night, the, where, the student, where were the students in the period under, uh, before 1968? The 68 student movements were almost exactly the way you'd hear students rallying around Schiller in Vienna and pulling him out of bed at night with his nightdress on and he'd have a beer with us and he'd have a beer with them and go home and, and then uh, the succession of students and it was Fodden and uh, Fischernich and, and um, Carl Sand. Um, I think the only difference would be that in, in Germany it was expanded over 1790 through maybe 248, uh, the student movements, uh, the Boschenschaften. Uh, interesting thing is Fulton pulled away from it, came to America, because those students were, were um, they were targets of the state under the autocratic Metternich until perhaps the 48 movement, the Schleswig-Holstein issues, perhaps that being the result of the student movements over many decades, the, the marching students. But the Hambach, I don't know that one that well, but the Hambach is cited more often. But it was larger, and it, it, I'm not sure what that movement did, but that was student also, wasn't it? Now, or was it broader population? I, I'm not sure. Students. They can tell you too. Hambach has. But uh, at least by, according to Eliza Cobalt, uh, uh, Fulton's wife, what Fulton pulled back from was the, the economic war. And I find it interesting that he did that just about the same time that uh, uh, Richard Wagner picked up the Faust, not for Goethe and the, the poetry and everything, but uh, and not even for the message of striving so much, but because Faust is, is Germanic war. In Dresden, he did that in the opera, 19, I think, 19, 1849. But the Dresden opera burned a year afterwards. It was destroyed in some kind of demonstration. But I've never heard it. A lot of this is in Dietrich Hanenhoff, in Hans Dietrich, Hans Dietrich, in, in both the night. It's in the citations there. And the, it's a wonderful novel story of the, the Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And it uh, was in book form 2005, and it's come out now in paperback, and it's not been translated into English, but I think it will be a landmark in, in the rallying around Beethoven's Ninth um, and the number of places where that has shown up. And now at the European Union, uh, some, no, the music is played, but the text is not sung. And so, what, what does that do? Um, and in this book, uh, what is his name again? We actually say his name correctly on the back sheet. The record says, uh, um, Dieter Hilsa, uh, really, he turns, um, I mean, if you take um, Clockwork Orange as a movie, and we know the text, but the movie uh, is also Beethoven-based, the symphony, the Ninth Symphony, if, we know, if you know the text, it's this juvenile rape scene, it's a musical, and the, um, the, the, the sickness, the decadence of that musical, and then finally the main youth in the end of the story, and, in, and at the end of the movie, um, is in a hospital, he's all wounded, and he's recovering, and in his recovery, in the background music, is Beethoven's Ninth again. It was in the opening scenes just before the raid, and then there's no Beethoven, no ninth. And then in the end, as he's recovering in a, in a hospital bed, and he's outgrowing his juvenile, it reminded me of uh, Günther Grass's Tin Drum, where, where there's a process of, of the Beethoven healing that's going on in that, that particular story. Well, Hildegard has a volume 
example is one. I think the one you can't stand the most is the Sony, uh, as the Crane, as Sony Center was being built in Berlin, the Cranes were to background music of Beethoven's Night. He debased, he finds that music has been debased, and especially the movie. And the European Union holds it as its, its anthem. I don't know the word for I think this is also kind of without considered um, ideas around him that Germany is absolutely not prepared for democracy. Uh, there were no um, points of reference to get into this concept, this idea of democracy. And he, he thought, what can I do to, to give an idea that is also conservative, something that nationalistic elements can um, relate to and um, that uh, can more liberal or uh, uh, progressive middle class um, persons, citizens can uh, relate to. And then he uh, found out that it could perhaps work with German romanticism. Yes. But um, as it turn, turned out, didn't uh, worked. It didn't work. Yes. And so um, at the end, I think, he came back to Goethe when he um, celebrated um, the 200th um, year of birth, uh, Goethe, 1949. He gave a talk in Frankfurt about Goethe und die Demokratie. And he came came back to this. And for me, a very interesting point of reference is uh, the um, idea to relate Goethe as a classical Weimar thinker to somebody uh, like Jefferson. This is strange, isn't it? The first time. But um, think about that what Goethe did 
um, in view to Berlin. He was uh, Weimar Chancellor, something like that. He was a politician also. That is something that's extremely neglected in the German uh, reception of Goethe. He was a social active po politician. And um, he really had um, things to do there in this small state, Weimar. And um, he accomplished things there. And I think that what his idea was that in the small, small, uh, also uh, communicative uh, um, interactions is everything. And that also political uh, ideology, if you want to use this word, is something very down to earth, immediate. It is um, something people have to build up from the bottom. And uh, that's what he stood for. Schiller, at the other side, was um, some more intellectual. He was fascinated by Kant, and he had some systematic idea also. But Goethe was, um, perhaps, this is not adequate to say, um, but only a very, very, very uh, um, a broad match, um, I would say so, uh, a bit, bit of patchwork. He was somebody who uh, experienced life then he did this, that his creativity was so open, he was so uh, responsive to that, what uh, comes up, that he had no idea of uh, a roof on top of uh, it, it all, and built it up from below. So that perhaps uh, uh, a concept that is uh, close to Jefferson's War Republics also, his idea that democracy needs education, if you read Eckermann's uh, uh, talks with uh, Goethe, a whole lot of things is said about education there, and so on. That's why the, on that point of um, Goethe and Schiller's last joint project, um, we always know the literary projects, but his last joint, their last joint project was a, uh, the, uh, a journal they called the Propylaean. The Propylaean is two years and it ran and it was through and through all education, and they, they describe the education of the future, um, and it looks like the liberal arts college, as opposed to the Humboldt's University of Berlin. The liberal arts college is aesthetic. It's the skills in the art of living, all the way from a wagon wheel that looks is equally function and but more pleasing, and that you do life and then Schiller in some ways develops Goethe into that theory that he described Goethe's life, his effectiveness, what you're pointing out. I think that that is a contrast, uh, interesting contrast between the Humboldt Brothers University of Berlin and uh, the Weimar Populean proposal. That, that, uh, I thought you're, you addressed somewhat uh, Eric's question well, you did address it here now, but when you were talking about um, Thomas Mann's attempt to create a mysticism, that was going to be my question too, was uh, Thomas Mann's uh, sense that in order to transition Germans to democracy, that you have to surround it with a sort of a mysticism, and that his closest access to that was romantic, which the Germans understood. Yes. And that, but that they need, that we need a mystique you use the word mysticism, so yes, maybe yes. So, so uh, uh, a quote by um, Thomas Mann, um, uh, Novalis, the need, Novalis, the need of the state is the most necessary need of man. To become and stay a human being, the state is needed. A human being without a state is a savage. All culture springs off the relation of the state. The more educated, the more part of an educated state. Novalis says. And uh, Mann comments uh, on this and says, um, this is exactly our situation, the Weimar Republic. It is incredible that he says this because uh, the, the 
the state that was, that was Bismarck. It was uh, William II. It was uh, just uh, three years, uh, four years after the uh, monarchy tumbled. And this was mysticism, Bismarck. This word alone uh, says everything. And he tries to make it uh, novalis reich yes, in his speech and um, transfer this mysticism, this tendency to mysticism of the state to uh, some democratic foundation and um, this was something that failed there in uh, this address because um, the ghosts of the past West were too strong. And this also sh shows something about um, the uh, German inclination to uh, authoritarian um, thinking, to authoritarian, um, even Thomas Mann uh, was fascinated by the idea of the Obrigkeitsstaat. Yeah, I don't know. I sort of reject that view. I mean, I, it's, it's popular, I understand, but it's too easy then to dip into this Zonderbeck thesis of you know, German peculiarities, and, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I appreciate the connections that you're making, I think it's really fascinating and interesting, but, you know, the entire 19th century then is lumped into a narrative um, of this Obrigkeitsstadt, and it seems to me, you know, I mean, it could potentially be reductive, um, you know, it, it sort of marginalizes um, the contributions of the people living, you know, in between the Kents. Um, the 48ers, so to speak, um, or, you know, other authors and other writers. But, I mean, this seems to be the pattern in, in German studies. You focus either on Romanticism and German Modernism, right, the two significant periods of achievement. I mean, everybody loves Thomas Mann, everybody loves Goethe. Um, but then there's sort of an absence, you know, in the long 19th century. Um, and, I mean, I think one of the things that this conference does that's really good is it shows how, um, you know, these issues related to the individual, the community, or the state, they're being worked out, you know, in different places, in different ways, um, whether it's in these conservative newspapers um, that are challenging different ideas of freedom, or whether it's in, you know, these stupid Geist of um, or urban mystery novels, or whatever they're called. Um, you know, I mean, I see that as resisting this Obrigkeitsstadt, and, you know, I'm, what, what it seems like we're doing is we're reading Thomas Mann's narrative of German history back onto 19th century German history. And that's not, that's not necessarily the only narrative. Um, yeah. What about the piece that if it's not the Zunderweg, and that's really a British and American historian's view that Germany did not progress towards a, a united democracy normal way, and, uh, and then the, the non-normal way for Germany is many Londons, uh, Munich and Berlin, as so we have many particular communities. But what about the community? Uh, that was the other piece in your talk that I thought might, we I might ask about is, is Thomas Mann really saying that politics is done best at, uh, at the district, at the house level? where the people are in touch with the grassroots of the people in communities and parishes in this, and in Germany still has, I think, taxes that go to the local school district and are fully controlled. Is that what could be what you create the, the small group? This is something that is very fascinating for me as a German uh, also, uh, because uh, Germany uh, went a com completely different way after 1945. And we had no chance, I think, after 1918. It was the French, the uh, British revanchism. It was that we were not supported by the American Congress with your president. And there, there, there was something of uh, a deep uh, darkness there. And this is also reflected in uh, this uh, speech of Thomas Mann. He's confused. He's confused about how to, to relate to young people to encourage them for this democracy. And um, 
the point that um, I lost the uh, it's not the parish, but the parochial, the, the local, the small, the community. That's that's the uh, uh, I, I, I want to take. Um, it is so incredible what changed. Uh, the upcoming Greens, for example, uh, they are a very strong party in Germany, and they are localizing. They are uh, a group that grew out of uh, 1968, this revolution. And they are practicing something what Thoreau does, what the American transcendentalism uh, does, but they, they, they were initially, uh, initially uh, SDS, socialists. They, they, they had the idea that communism is also good for West Germany. But their practice uh, was years to come changing and they became uh, really some uh, ground workers and uh, these small community uh, groups and uh, green movements and something like that is very 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 strong and then this incredible gift of uh, the 9th of November 1989 this is miraculous really nobody was shot no, Nobody can uh, explain this. Uh, nobody. If you, uh, uh, this is incredible. Uh, still for me, uh, this is a life-changing moment for me. I uh, drove to Berlin at the 10th of November, 11th of November, 1989. Uh, nearly didn't make it in the tower because every one who drove to Berlin and then all the East Germans came, came in. And the next day I was um, at the other side of uh, the wall, the GDR, and um, where um, um, this um, place uh, beside uh, Leipziger, Leip Leipziger Place, the other side. Um, now, uh, and, uh, the finance ministry of, of, of Germany uh, the truck uh, of uh, the um, uh, GDR army uh, drove to the wall. Yes, uh, they uh, drove uh, back and back to the wall, and then it was heard uh, um, at Kessel. Yes. Um, uh, they have a jack or a jackhammer, but uh, they they um, uh, hide it, hid it, hid it, hid it. Hid it, hid it. Um, at first, but the person who was there at the, at the back, yes, and stood there in the darkness um, for uh, make, making the wall fall down, yes, we, we uh, sat there on a the container uh, some meters away, and thought after five minutes, what am I doing here? I just uh, make the wall uh, fall down and I want to hide this process of uh, uh, damaging and making the wall uh, fall down. And then the um, drove five meters uh, away from the wall and he stepped down and then you could see him how he crushed the wall as he did with it. This was the uh, East German army that they inside. So this is something that is a uh, miracle still. And also, uh, well, maybe it is in the mystique of authority if we want to go back to that point that uh, it's like almost like the difference between um, Edmund Burke's view, view of the rights of man and the French Revolution and our Thomas Paine. And Edmund Burke doesn't want to throw the bat, baby out of the bat. And Thomas Paine is more radical. And uh, I think the Germans receive Edmund Burke better. And uh, they do play the line to authority. It, it, uh, Martin Luther would join the peasants' revolt either. But, uh, and so that maybe that is the answer. Well, 